Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and hooray, hooray for my guest today, who I have really come to get to know a little bit and admire a whole lot, um, and I can't wait to delve into the journey that she is taking. Um, It is Valerie Lomas, who, uh, you know what? At one point, uh, when we met about a year ago, I promised her I was only ever going to make her talk about a couple of things um, once, and so I will not make her talk about it. I'm going to give the backstory so she does not have to talk about this. Um, This incredible woman here, who you will know from online as a foodie in New York, is a baker, a TV personality and all kinds of things we're going to get into. And she was the winner of the first great American baking show. Um, You might not have known that because they didn't uh, show the entire series on TV. They showed the premiere and um, this incredible woman won it. They did not show it because of some of the really cruddy behavior of one of the judges. They shelved the show. She was deprived of her public victory, but she is reclaiming all of this in a big and beautiful and fantastic way that we're going to talk about more. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much, Kat. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we had been talking right before this about how I was going to introduce you because you are many, many things. Um, You are, well, when I met you, you were a lawyer and that is, what's up with that now? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, I was a lawyer for eight years Mm -hmm. and about seven months ago, I actually I left my job because I wanted to really devote myself to um, to this new journey that I'm on about being able to make food and write about food and share food with other people. So um, I still pay my bar dues. So technically, I'm still a lawyer, <laughs> but uh, I get to spend my days just making food and sharing it with other people. The way you share it is really generous and beautiful if you follow her on Instagram which you should do right this very moment at foodie in New York it is a celebration generally of of baking other kinds of food too but mostly um, baking and it was baking was a thing that you grew up with but you especially did as you were studying and working and traveling can you talk about what that looked like, how those, the intersection happened. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Mm -hmm. uh, which has just such an amazing, vibrant culture around food. So, um, so food was just kind of always there. And when I moved to Los Angeles for school, um, you know, well, I actually, I discovered avocados and guacamole. (laughs) I'd never had that before, but, um, I was a French major and I studied abroad in France and, I Just learned. casual French major. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and I was exposed to a completely different culture that was also so food centric. And, you know, just walking by the little pastry shops, mm. I was totally seduced by how beautiful they were and how, you know, the aromas just wafting as you walk down the streets. And uh, so naturally, I went to law school next. And during my final year of law school, I was... Uh, so, okay, so you <laughs> you said naturally right there. What is, tell me about what is natural from French major to law student? Yeah, th- I mean, there's nothing natural about it. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to go to graduate school. Mm-hmm. And I had debated a lot of different things. And I think it was kind of like, you know, the the clock had stopped. It's time to graduate. So I decided, (laughs) I decided to go to law school and I, you know, I, I, I've always considered myself an advocate for, um, for causes that I feel strongly about. So I thought it would be a good fit. So, so what kind of law were you studying? Yeah. Um, so the thing about law school, <laughs> yeah, I know nothing. Ab- I know nothing about it. So right. I come at this from a place of yeah. I don't understand this stuff. So your first year, everyone studies the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. So you're learning everything from like the procedural rules about court filings and serving subpoenas to um, to torts, so like negligence. <gasps> Tort with a just a T, not an E. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, 
you know, interesting things actually like, oh, if a, a champagne bottle pops open and hits someone in the eye or injures someone, what's the liability is there for cork the company? Law? <laughs> yeah, uh, there is, cork law is tort law. Ah. So, um, so you know, you know, I just learned a lot of different things. And the next year I, I took classes that I was more interested in. Mm-hmm. So classes on like gender discrimination um, and um even like election law classes. Wow, relevant because, now. <laughs> yeah, I was always just drawn to those types of things. And I spent a summer at a law firm before my last year, as most people do. And because the recession was just in full swing, um, none of us got offers, actually. So I ended up spending my last year of law school baking to kind of get myself out of this funk of I just spent all of this time and money money and energy and I don't have a job let's talk about the baking's role in that because I know when I was in grad school I did so much stress baking Uh where I I couldn't even eat most of what I was making because Uh like uh, sugar and me are not a not a great fit and I was just I had a weird relationship with food at the time and I would just bake 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 I'd go into the the studio and work on metal things and, you know, and and that's very satisfying in its own way. I was dealing with a breakup and playing with fire and metal. And then I would get home and baking is pretty inexpensive, at least the kind that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Not anywhere near your level of baking. I'm just doing, you know, dump cooking and, you know, making make a coffee cake, a banana bread or something like that. Cookies. And I lived with a bunch of dudes who I really never had to worry about where this stuff was going to go. So I uh, I would bake this stuff and it was such a tension reliever. Is that what you were doing? How did you, how was what was baking's role in this notoriously stressful process? Yeah. So um I mean it actually it, it played a two-part role. Yeah. So for one it was definitely a way for me to escape. Yeah. And you know I was baking the things that I grew up eating, but then I decided to kind of push the envelope and bake things that, you know, I was eating in California, like scones. Like mm-hmm. we didn't really eat those growing up in Baton Rouge. Grandma, grandma wasn't right. making scones. What was grandma making? <laughs> grandma was making biscuits mm. and cakes and pies and fig preserves. Ooh. Oh my gosh, the fig preserves. Um, Talk, <laughs> tell me about these fig preserves if you don't mind. <laughs> so, uh, my, so my grandmother, she had a green thumb. Um, she actually lived there. She had a a lot of land in her family Mm -hmm. and they were prolific farmers Um, her grandparents and her great grandparents and they actually got this land through the homestead act so um oh explain that yeah uh so i believe it was my great great grandfather he came down from the midwest Mm -hmm. and he got his 40 acres and that a lot of that land stayed in the family and they farmed that land and they were really amazing farmers. So my grandmother, she had eight sons and, um, you know, at the time she, she couldn't really get jobs anywhere else. So she, she worked as a domestic. So she worked, um, with other people's families taking mm-hmm. care of their kids and cooking and she food had eight for them at home. Huh? Right. And she had eight sons at wow. home. So, um, you know, they, they didn't necessarily have a lot of cash coming in and mm-hmm. out of the house, but her husband, what, you know, he, he fished, he hunted, uh, you know, he hunted things like squirrels and raccoons and whatever I've was around. Plenty of squirrel. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and he made like strawberry wine, wine from strawberries. Um, and those Louis- Louisiana strawberries, the, the oh, yeah. Ponchatoula strawberries. Oh yeah. Oh, Oh, I've yeah. seen you work with strawberries. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so you know, she farmed and they weren't just farming like a few things here and mm-hmm. there. Um, you know, it was it was like three different types of snap beans and bush beans and melons and berries. And she had a few fig trees and fig trees mm-hmm. make like a lot of they make a lot of fruit. So um, that's I mean, some of my favorite memories are just going to her house and you know, she'd pluck a fig, oh, God. still like warm from the sun, just blazing. And you take like a big juicy bite and you look inside. Inside figs is kind of scary. Um, <laughs> there, there was just uh, some story. Look. Well, there was just a, a story about how like they have, uh, you know, vegans won't eat them because they have so many bugs in them. And stuff. Oh, like, but that's part of it. Like that's yeah. part of nature. Yeah. Because they are made, I think, by killing bugs. There's some. Yeah. Crazy... They somehow like a bug goes inside and it gets yeah. trapped. And that's how a fig is made. And it's interesting, you know, I moved, when I moved to California and I I went by 
figs at like Trader Joe's and you would get a packet with four figs, which is, oh, that's that's, that's a rough stingy. transition. Yeah. But uh, the figs were so different because they had this very thick skin, which I understand is important for, you know, transporting. But I wanted those, you know, those from grandma's tree with like the the thin skin and just so juicy and sweet. Oh. And I haven't gotten those outside of Louisiana. Oh my gosh. How often do you go back? I go home all the time. I would. <laughs> if my grandmother had a fig tree like that. Both my grandmothers are gone. Another one of them had figs like that. But so, mm. so you came to baking from a, a real place of hands-on uh, adoration and attention, and, and that's a, that's a really beautiful way. Because I think the way that recipes can get transmitted that didn't happen for me because nobody in my family really had that, that thing. My dad picked up cooking later. Uh, I didn't have that hands-on kind of thing. And so did you stand side by side? How did this work? <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, there are a few recipes that I definitely, um, you know, my mother was like, you need to go to your grandmother's house and learn how to yeah. make that. So I did, I went mm -hmm. and I, you know, I watched her and, you know, my grandmother in Prairie, Prairieville is the town where, um, where she lived and she's just like the sweetest person but she's so quiet which is ironic because like her children and grandchildren we yeah. can't seem to stop talking but <laughs> she's just so quiet but um yeah I would just watch her and she would tell me what to do and I I was able to get some of her you know most famed recipes that way that's so lovely and yeah. so so you have this tie to baking and you're in the middle of a stressful <laughs> yeah situation in Los Angeles of all oh, places oh my goodness and and you're you're studying you're trying to figure out what the heck is next and yeah Maybe there's a familiar muscle memory in the baking. So, so you're 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 doing this thing of where, what comes next from that. Uh, so you're 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 trying to figure out what's next, and you went to Paris from there. Was it Paris or was it? France? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I spent my last year of law school baking and mm -hmm. bringing those things to class. And at the time, I was living with my sister, um, and her fiance had just passed away unexpectedly. Oh, I'm so sorry. So. It was actually a way that we also kind of came together and we could have a moment of just like happiness and joy because, um, you know, she was working long hours. She was a, a resident. She's an OBGYN. And there are she, no slouches in your family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, she was working crazy hours um, and she would come home and there would be something on the cake stand, like some muffins or or just something. And I think it was also just really special to uh, be able to to help her kind of escape what she was going with, going through um, as well. So, so yeah, so I, I spent that year baking. I didn't apply for a single job uh, because I was hurt. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was also 24 at the time. So, you know, looking back, it's like, you know, something no one like knows that. Anything when they're, right? <laughs> when they're 24. Something oh. like that happens. It's like you get up and you, you do it again you're, and you put yourself out there. You're made of rubber <laughs> at, at, at that age. I think a lot of people are. Right. But uh, instead I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to go to France for a year. So I found a language assistant job. It was like a part-time 12 mm -hmm. hours a week um, teaching English at a school. And I decided to moved to France and just kind of like eat my way around the country. So where were you based and then where did you go? Yeah. So the school I was at was in Ile de France. So it was just a suburb of Paris. And I lived in Paris the first bit of time that I was there. Um, I had roommates and the awesome thing about like um, about French people, even like young people in a roommate situation is everyone comes home at night and makes dinner together. Oh, lovely. so uh, and it can be like the simplest thing. Like it could be like, you know, pasta with some smoked salmon and some, you know, creme fraiche liquid, which is just very plentiful there. Um, it could be very simple, but it was something that we did together. Um, so that. That was really special, but uh, that's beautiful. And like, where was I? <laughs> I know, like, I'm going into a place where, like, I want to go to that place and have the pasta <laughs> with the yeah. with the salmon. But also, the baking stuff is mm -hmm. is is different, especially where you're coming from. My, yeah. my husband is from North Carolina, um, and it, his name is Douglas, but his family calls him Doug. And uh, <laughs> and it, I remember him telling me an aunt of his saying, 
boy, you know what a croissant is. It's like a biscuit, only they eat it in Perry. And so he had this this notion of like, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> but there are some commonalities between, you know, biscuits, especially if you're doing something with lots and lots of layers mm-hmm. and taking that into like a laminated dough like you would find a, you know, a biscuit in, in, in Perry. So talk to me about the different, about that particular technical step Mm -hmm. for you of learning the recipes that you grew up with and then seeing this different kind of representation of what baked goods could be in France. Yeah. Um, And, you know, that's that's such a great question because things are so different. So like one thing I noticed was, you know, in France, things are less sweet. And I enjoy that because maybe because I want to eat a lot of them. So I don't necessarily want stuff to be too sweet. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like what we what we sometimes use, like jello pudding, vanilla pudding and things, because, um, you know, sometimes you make things from scratch and sometimes you use a box mix because I I don't know. Banana pudding. Yeah. Vanilla wafers. (laughs) It's good stuff. Because you've got kids and a job and a lot to do. Right. Right. Um, And then, you know, you you discover pastry cream in Paris and it's got that that similar feeling um so there was definitely like when I was in Paris it was more of like discovering Mm -hmm. discovering pastries and baked goods and um and what they could be and how how they could look different but kind of be the same um and it's funny because when I went back to Louisiana and I had this reverse culture shock You know, I realized how much of New Orleans particularly looks just like Paris. It's true. Yeah. Some, some, like the ironwork, the the building, the architecture, the the sort of coffee culture. Yeah, absolutely. There's a cafe culture and even the street names. Yes. Um, I was just in (laughs) New Orleans last weekend and yeah, like Saint something or Le something. (laughs) Yeah. They just completely anglicized the names, right? So Mm -hmm. instead of the Champs-Élysées, you have... Elysian Fields, Mm -hmm. and that's a major street. And you have uh, what they call in New Orleans, Chartres, which is Chartres, which is a very difficult word to say. But, you know, you just you just speak it in an English way. And they've got like the same names of streets. And it's there's definitely a a very common shared culture. It really it does feel that way. And when you're so when you're exploring pastry is it and you're there, do you do an analytical thing where you think like you eat something and reverse engineer it about like, how did they make that? Or do you watch somebody do it? What was your process as I'm, I'm like imagining like <laughs> this moment of, of you like biting into your first like peri breasts or something oh, like yeah. that. And so are you just, uh, is it a moment of enjoyment or a moment of analysis or what is it? Yeah. I mean, so at the beginning it was definitely just a moment of like discovery and enjoyment. And I, I loved learning about the history of different pastries. So like I went to, Bordeaux because mm. why not um and I discovered the cannelé pastries oh, god those yeah and I I was touring wineries learning that well the nuns they used to use egg whites to filter the wine so they had this plethora of egg yolks so that's why you ended up with these pastries that are very custardy and use a lot of egg yolks and I was like wow I love it I get it um and I love eating cannelés and then there's not a texture <laughs> like that in a, any American pastry that I can think of I remember I had my yeah. first one just like a few years ago Mm -hmm. and thinking I had just never with that kind of waxy outside and spongy inside of it like that's it's so crazy to me to think like it's fundamentally the same ingredients there's eggs there's sugar there's flour there's Mm -hmm. butter yeah and yet (laughs) and yet exactly and I I don't know there's like an alchemy to baking that Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of magical and um and yeah so it's it's you know, in somewhere like like France, where they have like this history of you know wineries, and everyone is still ending up you like baking, and even you know where I'm from in in Louisiana, you're using those same ingredients to make biscuits. So um, I think I've always been kind of drawn to that. Like you can really do anything with whatever it is that's in front of you. Yeah, and so you have this experience. You you go to France and you come back home. And you did become a lawyer. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. So, so you 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 came back to Louisiana, mm-hmm. and then no, oh, actually, I went I went straight to New York. Oh, you did. Okay, yeah. so you so your trajectory is you go Louisiana, California, 
Paris. For Paris, and then New York. And yeah. moving to New York is no joke. I moved here when I was 23, about to turn 24. So you were probably around the same. What did that look like for you, landing in New York? I had no idea what I I had gotten myself into. Right, same. <laughs> um, there's no city like New York City. And... Um, yeah, so you know, I moved to New York because the the guy I was dating at the time. Oh, ended up, there's um, always a thing. Crazy. Yeah, <laughs> there's a reason. Um, he ended up moving to New York for his job. He didn't have a choice, so it was like, oh, great, I'll I'll move to New York. And I got here, and um, New York is no LA. Everything is just happening. It's in your face. It's in <laughs> your face. Um, it probably took me like six months to just like walk fast enough down the street, mm-hmm. but. I discovered like an like another whole new wonderful world of of things like babka and like really good bagels and um so yeah, I, I moved out here. I got a job. I was a public. De- I started as a public defender. Oh, good. Yeah. So where were you for that? Were you in Manhattan, Brooklyn? Yeah, I was in Manhattan. Um, and you know, I spent my mornings down at the courthouse doing bond hearings, and uh, it was it was. A very interesting, like, firsthand look at um, at our criminal justice system. Yeah, talk through that. So, so how did you end up in that particular sector, and what did you uh, what did you learn from that? Yeah, what are what do you want to fix? <laughs> I, guess, I know, big question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's funny. I think there are like two types of people who go to law school. There mm-hmm. are those who should be in a courtroom and those who generally are like advisor types. Mm-hmm. So I was I was always like the one who should be in a courtroom, the lit- litigator type. And when I moved to New York, I just I ended up reaching out to the director of this organization mm-hmm. and he like invited me to to come in and met me that day and and brought me on as a trial assistant. So um, in a way, I got I got very lucky. I was very fortunate. And um, and. You know, I had done a f- some stuff in the summer before working um, on the public defense side of things. So I knew what I was getting into, but it was jarring to mm-hmm. see um, so many people who we met at these um, bond hearings who had spent the night in jail or the weekend in jail. It was for jumping the subway turnstile. Yeah. Uh, this was 20, this was 2011. And I had just come from Paris where people did that for sport. You know, it was it was like you get a ticket. It wasn't something that you get arrested for. So it was very, um, it was very shocking to see mm-hmm. that this was at the time like a crime that people were getting arrested for. Well, because it's it's a it's such a thing in New York. I mean, it's it's expensive to ride the subway. This tends to be a matter of economic need. People aren't, you know, maybe there's some people who are doing it for for fun, you know, some kids or, or something like that. But a lot of people just can't friggin' afford right. to get on the subway. Right. And you don't expect that that is something that you're going to land in jail for. I, right. ex-boyfriend of mine, <laughs> that, that happened to. And uh, I think he was, you know, and he grew up in New York. He, you know. He, he, he knew the stakes and he did it anyway and got right. arrested for it. I don't know how long he had to serve. But, yeah, it's it's one of those things where, uh, you know, our, our system is is so screwed up. People, you know, we could we could really yeah. go for a long time on this. The weed crimes, the, the subway jumping, all that kind of stuff that seems like it should maybe be a ticket. And yet it is something else. Yes. There was a lot of the, you know, I think it was called like simple possession. Yeah. Lots of that also. Um, that was most of what we saw. So that was um, that was something where, again, it was like I was devoting myself to, but I needed, I needed another outlet because it's very heavy doing that type of work. Yeah. And it's extremely important work, and I admire um, people who do it. And at the same time, it was like, well, something inside of me needs to bake. Yes. So I had left my my stand mixer in L.A. and I called my sister and I was like, look, you've (sighs) got to send it to me. Like there is something inside of me that just has to that has to bake. Mm -hmm. So she sent it to me. (laughs) Is it like the KitchenAid stand mixer? Yeah. What color do you have? So I had the bronze. Okay. And it was the professional size because my mother, she's kind of like an extremist. And when I graduated college, she got me a gigantic 
stand mixer. <gasps> stand mixers are, are, it's funny, it's such an occasion <laughs> present. It's for graduations, it's for weddings. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I got mine for, for my wedding. I have a, a red one and I lo- with with the ice cream attachment, which I'm very, very fond of. But it, it really is, I can't say enough about the meditative nature mm-hmm. of of baking yeah so when you're you're doing this you're you know you have this incredible the weight of all these people's well-being on your shoulders in a system that is deeply broken and unfair and things while you're baking do you shut off from that or is it are you processing it does it sort of seep into what I know that's a silly question but does it seep into what you're doing How, what's what's the process like for you yeah so I mean at this particular time I had decided that I was going to master the macaron oh yeah. those are not so not a joke. <laughs> because when I was in Paris I I've I fell in love with with macarons and I mm-hmm. decided I wanted to make them and sell them so Ooh. um so uh so for me, I was all in. I was completely focused because I'm sitting here making an Italian meringue, like looking at a pot of of sugary water, you know, starting to like bubble. And I'm like, all right, are we at the softball stage yet? And, you know, and I'm looking at the egg whites, like, do we need to crank the speed up on the mixer so that they're the right, you know, so that they're that they're at the right consistency before I pour the syrup in to make my meringue. So I was like, I was all in completely focused. Um, And I think that was the benefit for me that I was present. I was present as I was doing it. And... You, so you had an intent on selling them. So you're, yeah. you're making them. Do you yeah. start like giving them to friends first? To be like, hey, can I sell this? Like, what is right? So I mean, I made them for like weeks, and the only person who got them was the trash can because <laughs> they were uh, they were they were all all wrong. Um, I later learned, and this is why it's important to have a thermometer in your oven. Mm-hmm. The oven that I was using in my you know studio apartment was not calibrated correctly. So I was actually cooking them at like a temperature that was way too high. So they were cracked. They were browned. They like, I think everything that could go wrong went wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. And then once I got it, I applied for the Hot Bread Kitchen Incubator Program. Let's tell people about that because (laughs) it is an incredible program. Yeah. Um, And so this must have been fall 2011. Okay. Yeah. I, I must have just been Googling, like, I don't know how to start a food business, what to do. And I just, I came across um, something and it was like, you need a business plan. So I went, I checked out a book at the library, how to write a business plan. And I wrote a business plan, uh, which is interesting. I think I didn't really quite have a lot of business savvy. And at the time I was just like, I want to use like, you know, the highest quality of everything because these macaroons, they were like, I, it felt like I was making little children of mine to go out into the world <laughs> and make people children. happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I wanted to just put as much love and mm-hmm. care as possible. Um, so, so yeah, I applied for this program and I got, I got accepted and I met some awesome people who, um, who kind of helped me strategize. Mm-hmm. Um, someone even like walk, I, they, I showed them my process of making them and they walked me through how to make them a little bit more cost effective mm-hmm. and efficiently and in a commercial kitchen. So I made them and I, I sold them at markets for a few weekends. Oh. And uh, yeah, I sold, I sold them at the new Amsterdam Valentine's Day market and I got such great feedback. And what did you call it? Jaune. Jaune. Yeah. Like, like yellow. Happy. Oh, jaune. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so were they all yellow ones? No. <laughs> but like, it's funny. I think lemon was probably my favorite flavor. Mm. Lemon has always been like, it's just perfect for desserts because, like I said, I don't like things too sweet, but. I'm a, I'm a lemon dessert person myself. Yeah. So you have this experience and getting the positive feedback because it's one thing yeah. if you're doing it to make yourself happy, but it's another <laughs> one. people are willing to pay cash money <laughs> for it. So, yeah. so you've got this, this validation of it yeah. and are, are you're doing this simultaneously while, while practicing working. law. Exactly. So things got to a point where, you know, they were going too well. So like for that market, I sold out in the in the first day I think I made like 1200 and I sold I sold out the first day and I had taken off at least two or three days of work to prepare for that weekend so I kind of was faced with this well what am I gonna do am I gonna am I gonna try to sell macaroons that all right let's be real they don't really have a great shelf life and I'm using like 
it, I'm using real ingredients that are pricey. And at the time, I didn't quite have the business acumen. Um, so I was like, am I going to do that? Or am I going to like somehow validate this law degree right. <laughs> and this job that I've worked so hard to get? So I decided to kind of shelf that and and just go back to being a lawyer. And I, I still baked and I, I blogged probably once a month or so. Um, and that's how things were for the next probably five or six years. And then someone <laughs> notices your Instagram. Right, right. And then and then I get on Instagram, right? Because I had kind of been in like a more of a vacuum of a food world and a mm-hmm. a. a a blog world where um, I wasn't really engaging with a community. Mm-hmm. So I got on Instagram and it was this whole community of other people who are kind of like me who have this passion for something and they're doing it and they're doing it all the time. So, um, so I started, I started um, shooting things more regularly and I, I upgraded my camera and I started taking better food pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's, that's when someone discovered my Instagram account and they were like, hey, have you heard of the Great American Baking Show? We're casting for it. And is this the, the, was that the first season of it? No, it was actually the third season. Okay. Yeah, it had, <laughs> it's kind of complicated. I think it had had another life on another network. Okay. Yeah. And people were familiar with the Great British. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I was I was watching the Great British Bake Off. Um, I was I was a fan because it's watching it is like very it's like pleasant it's, and happy. And people are so supportive and lovely. You watch other <laughs> cooking shows and people are like really incentivized to sabotage one another. Right, <laughs> right, really. right. Um, yeah, everything just looks so like happy. Um, it's edited, by the way. Yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> because there are times where it's chaotic in the big white tent. But um, so you talk about the process of getting on the show. So they reached out to you. Yeah. Um. I mean, someone just they they emailed me and they were like, hey, uh, would you be interested? If so, we can set up a call. And I think it was like the day after my birthday. So I and I I get the birthday blues. Yep. Same. So I was <laughs> in this whole like post birthday. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> yep. It was one of those. And um, what what birthday was it? Well, this was twenty seventeen. So it was my thirty second birthday. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a lot of stuff happened for me at, at 32. Oh, really? <laughs> it really did. It's weir- weirdly yes. <laughs> um, so you're having this moment of like, okay successful lawyer all this this stuff been practicing for a while um did you have any skepticism about doing this or were you just like hey yes it's all been leading up to this yeah I mean so I would only say I was skeptical in the sense I didn't think anything would come of it Mm -hmm. because a few months ago like some people at a different show had reached out to me and you know it was like you kind of go through this process um And nothing really came of it. Mm -hmm. And I learned like with television, it's like the stars have to align. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Even if you're like a great fit, if it's not the right time or it's not the right balance, it's not going to work. So I was kind of like, okay, I don't I don't know if anything will come of this, but let me put myself out there because I was spending so much of my free time um, to my craft, like making and baking and photographing and yeah. editing and the, sharing you have to see these photographs they're so gorgeous like you just want to like reach through your phone and <laughs> she wanted yeah so um so I was like you know what let's let's see what happens and it happened you got the call yeah I got the call so um then you have to rearrange your life yeah uh <laughs> absolutely so it was funny because at the time I think I had somewhat recently been promoted. So I was a supervisor of, I don't know, like maybe six or seven people. Mm -hmm. So it was a big ask to step away from um, my job for an extended period of time. Five weeks, was it? Yeah, it was about five weeks. Um, But it was funny because my boss, I had just made him a birthday cake. And he told me, and this was like probably a week before I got the call about auditioning. He was like, you know, I had a dream that you were going to compete on the Great British Big Off. And I was like, what? 
<laughs> That's uh, pretty significant. Yeah. So I'm glad that seed was planted in his head. Okay. Because when I told him, he was like really excited. He was like, you know what? We're going to make this work. Um, so they ended up being very accommodating. That's so, And so where did you travel then? You had to travel to England? Yeah. So... <laughs> We filmed in we filmed in England at um, at Pinewood Studios, which is kind of right outside of London, uh, and it was pretty incredible because you see this you walk you walk in and then you walk outside and there's this big white tent and the gardens and it all feels very surreal and like they filmed Mary Poppins in those mm. gardens and I'm a huge Julie Andrews fan and it was just like. Um, is this really happening? And also, are we really baking outside? That's, <laughs> challenge. That's really challenging. It's like, what are the power sources for the ovens? Right, and- right. Um, and, you know, for the most part, baking outside is fine. But, like, I think the day we did macaroons, it was, like, rainy and humid. Oh, and that's that, evil. <laughs> yeah, that actually affected, like, how long it takes them to dry out. I mean, mm-hmm. you've got, like, a very short amount of time to get your macaroon tower done you know, it plays a factor. I should so. imagine. <laughs> so talk through some of the moments that we didn't get to see some, like what, what was your favorite challenge that you got to do? Ooh, favorite challenge. Huh. I would say we, so there was a French week. Okay. And I told myself, I was like, I just want to get to French week. <laughs> Mostly because I wanted to speak French. <laughs> right. Speak in French for the camera. Speak in French for the cameras. And um, I really wanted to get to French week. And our technical challenge, like the surprise that challenge, was to make a peri breast. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was so awesome about that, um, and it wasn't like the individual one. It was a, a big one. It's like you're making stuff that you you probably aren't going to make at home. And you have literally like, I don't know, two hours. You have two hours. You have the ingredients that you need. You have some of the directions, not all of the directions. Like, are you supposed to know already how to make a peri breast? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I think you're supposed to know how to make shoe pastry. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to know how to make pastry cream and, and praline and f- how to fold the praline into the pastry cream to make the filling. And, um, oh my God. yeah, it was, it was a lot, but it was kind of towards the end of the competition and it was just so in a way fulfilling to be able to do it. And like, I, I had actually, I threw out my first batch of shoe pastry cause I had added like a little too much egg. So it was a little too runny. So I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to run out of time. It's me against the clock. Yeah. Uh, but I was able to make a second batch and, it was so amazing to just see like all of these bits and pieces that like I had learned, like not just since I was there, but you know, over the past probably eight or nine years. This is your life coming together. Yeah. On a plate. It was literally coming together and to see it like lined up against, you know, the other contestants and just to see what we had all accomplished. Um, that was like, that was a happy story from a technical challenge. That is beautiful. <laughs> I really like that. Talk about the stress during it. Cause you're away from your support system. You're, you know, I'm sure there are crazy hours. I've had friends who've been on, on a lot of mm-hmm. reality cooking competition mm-hmm. shows and they've, you know, they've talked about some of the social experiments that are played upon them <laughs> where they're ply- plied with alcohol or, or drama is fomented for various things. Does that happen on this? Show? Cause I tend to think of this as being a pretty positive show. So can you talk about like what the social dynamics are as part of that? Yeah. I mean, I think that like for what it is, it's a, it's a pretty positive show. Um, it's still a competition. So like, you know, even though like people want to help you and they'll lend you your role, their rolling pen at home to practice, you know, it's, you might get a side eye if you do really well in that challenge when someone helped you. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's still a competition, but I don't know. I think people who bake are just people who are used to sharing and people who, um, want to, be generous and want to give. And I totally got that vibe. Um, The production aspect of it, I quickly learned this is a television show. Mm -hmm. And this is like a major show on a major network. And that is what is being produced. So, um, you know, it is daunting when you are when you're making stuff, because like with the challenges, you know, I think it was like the pie challenge, we had to make a cream pie. And it was like, I didn't, 
I didn't grow up making cream pies mm-hmm. and I love pies. It's one of my favorite things to make. Like I was like, I have a killer pecan pie recipe. I want to make that. I want to like, Louisiana person. Yeah, so. I'm like, I want to wow the judges, but like I had to make a cream pie. And apparently I, I made a, a custard pie, which is not a cream pie. And you know, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was punished for it. Right. Um, so I think just like the stress though, of like wanting to push yourself mm-hmm. and I wanted to just do like the absolute best that I could do. And I have that like place inside of me where I turn it on. Right. It's like that place I went to when I was studying for the bar exam. It's like that same place where you turn it on, you know, it's for a set period of time and you just give it everything that you have. So that's where I was. So when you're in that place and you're making something and you are like screwing it up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was the gingerbread house challenge. Um, I was like, I'm going to make a brownstone. And as I'm making it, like it didn't have time to dry out. The wall cracks in half. Oh, no. Right. And as it's happening, you know, producers are whispering to have all the cameramen come to get it from every angle. So it's like, you know, as your house is falling. <laughs> down. Yeah. Like literally. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's a, so it's like every little like mistake that you make is re- truly amplified. Mm-hmm. And you have the understanding that like this is for national television, like millions of people are going to see you screw up. And that is like a level of, of stress that I don't think I had felt before. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something that like it took some some time to come down from. It wasn't just like, oh, that challenge sucked and I did bad and I think I'm going home and, you know, now I'm going to go have lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine like and especially in that bubble where you've been living this competition yeah. for all this time. Yeah. It must feel like the whole world. It did. And like in a way, it also felt like summer camp because you know, you're with this group of people and you're all doing the same thing at the same time. And you have the same goals. So like in a way, like it, I, I really improved my baking and like that five weeks that I was there so much. And I was, you know, I got to meet people from all over the country who were baking different types of food, like from their cultures, like um, one guy, Hector, who's also a lawyer. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> he's also a lawyer. He went to Yale undergrad, like super smart. Um, He's Mexican. He lives in L.A. And he was making food that like I had like the flavors I had never tasted before and the techniques and the methods and just he's another person just so generous with what he was doing and he showed me how to like you know make a burnt caramel and Mm. like really push it to the limits by adding corn syrup so um (laughs) that sounds like wonderful and collaborative and yeah um in many ways it was and then you know when someone gets eliminated and they might still be there because that's just the nature of how it was set up. It's, you know, it's, it's just something you kind of have to negotiate socially. Yeah. That, that seems like that you, you really get to bond with people. Yeah. And also you're, you're feeling all of this. And I know there had to also be the pressure of representation because there haven't been a lot of contestants of color necessarily. Right. And I, I imagine that that had to be a huge pressure as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, So like one thing before we even went to London, like I knew I was like, okay, I want to like wear my natural hair. Mm -hmm. Like it's important to me that like that's what's being represented Mm -hmm. um, just from like um, just from a place of of being a black woman and Mm -hmm. and showing especially like little girls like right like that you know whatever your hair is, it's beautiful. So that was one thing. And then I also I wanted to you know, I wanted to show my, my culture, my Louisiana culture, and also my African American culture. So, you know, I was always thinking about the challenges, like, how can I do something that's representative? So, um, you know, we had like a, a signature loaf challenge. What is a signature? (laughs) Tell me what a signature loaf is. Right. It was like, I think it just had to be like a yeast raised bread and a holiday festive shape and filling and all of these all of these different requirements and so I made a king cake and (gasps) so perfect (laughs) okay if you would explain for people who are not uh, familiar with the tradition of king cake yeah what this beautiful thing is yeah so um in Louisiana and a few other places in the south especially Biloxi maybe yeah Mobile Alabama um during carnival season which starts January 6th and lasts through Mardi Gras so it's months it's not like weeks it's literally like two months 
three months, however long it is. Uh, everyone in Louisiana goes Mardi Gras crazy. And one thing that we eat constantly are king cakes. And they are, they're kind of similar to a cinnamon roll, actually. Um, and... So cake is a, a bit of a misnomer, yeah. but they are decorated with Mardi Gras colors, which is purple, gold, and green. And you hide a little plastic baby inside and whoever gets the piece with the baby has to bring the next king cake. So they're definitely communal in the sense of like, you're not going to have leftover king cake. Nope. Like if there are six people, you're cutting six pieces <laughs> and everyone is expected to like finish their peas until someone gets the little the little baby and they bring the next king cake so it's it's like the cake that keeps on giving um so I made a king cake which was special for me and um also like the little baby inside was a little a little brown baby oh that's so (laughs) did you have to bring the baby with you yeah I did okay I did um and it's funny because Paul Hollywood got the baby. And I think people think that it was planned. It was not planned. And I was so sneaky when I hit the baby. I really don't think anyone saw. I think it was just like, it was just one of those like beautiful signs of like, okay, good fortune is coming. Because people have a trick also about, they say, oh, you can see the seam on the cake. So you see where the baby is. Like, all these things that Paul Hollywood was fated to get. He was fated to get the king cake baby. And that was just like such a sweet moment. And that was on an episode that aired so I know like everyone back home was just like cheering um yeah that's that is a lovely lovely representation and I think that's beautiful Uh, talk talk about the moment that you won oh so um (laughs) like by that it's funny like by that point and the competition you know we were just like really pushing along Mm -hmm. and pushing through and the final challenge was a doozy I think it I think it was five or five and a half hours and it was literally just like giving it every like I gave it everything I had and there there was nothing left there was nothing left so to know that like I gave it my all and it was enough to win Mm -hmm. uh it was such a special feeling and not just like enough to win. I was, I was truly proud of the desserts that I made uh, and they were so well received by um, not just the judges, but like, it's nice because they have a little party at the end and the other contestants and my mom and sister were there and everyone, you know, they actually get to eat what you've made. So it was such a special moment because I didn't, I didn't think, you know, I was going to get through the first couple of episodes. Right. And I I actually had the pleasure of seeing you make uh, this this dish, the, the milfoy, because mm-hmm. uh, you came in and, and did that for us at Extra Crispy. And the level of artistry that you you make it look like nothing, like you're just breezing <laughs> through. I couldn't make that in a million years <laughs> if I tried. And I saw you do this and I I just it was almost an emotional thing Mm. watching your process making you seeing you go from these ingredients into making this thing that would be proudly shown in any you know Paris bakery window Mm -hmm. it's you made it was an astonishing thing watching you bake watching you make this art Mm -hmm. so you have this you have this victory in the world that you didn't get to celebrate in the manner that you you should have. Because usually what happens with one of these shows is, you know, they go through the whole thing. People get invested in people's stories. Then immediate, like, oh, you get a show, you get a book, to you know, whatever <laughs> it happens to be. And right. instead you were uh, left with this moment of, like, there was, you know, there, there, there was a brief thing on the website about it. I remember I found out who you were because I reached out to my friend Adrian Miller and I just sort of said, like, hey who's on your radar who should be on everybody's radar? And he Mm. said, reach out to Valerie Lomas. And I I learned your story and I got to know you as a baker and having this incredible uh, story as a lawyer Mm. and, and doing all of this stuff. Um, But you didn't get the boost up from the the show. I am thrilled to say that a really great thing has happened that you just announced uh, within hours of this happening. Can you tell what has happened? Yeah. So um, I am officially working on a cookbook yes. and um, <laughs> I, I couldn't be more excited and um, it's going to be published with Clarkson Potter uh, and they like, 
to me, like, it's crazy because so many, like, you know, people and cookbooks that I've admired um, growing up, even like Martha Stewart's Cupcakes book. Oh, wow. Like, yes. they published that book. Um, so, you know, it feels like I'm at this place where it's like, you know, there was like that work that happened. But over the past year, I've met people like you, people like Adrian, uh, people like Julia Tertian, mm-hmm. people like Dana Cowan, who have kind of just championed me and what I've done and have helped kind of propel me to be able to continue to make a career out of this. And you've stopped your law practice. Right, right. So, bold. you know, <laughs> let's so I'm so proud of you. That is such a a bold smart investment in yourself. Mm. Uh how what was the emotional process of mm. that? Yeah, um so I think let's see. So the show was supposed to air starting December and um and I knew like no matter what happened, I knew I was still going to like give it everything I had because I was already so invested. So it was like the same part of me that that pushed through the competition and through the finale. It was still there and it was still pushing, Uh, except now I I had a little more help from some some people in in the food world who I didn't know before. So um, it's what you deserved all (laughs) along is the the thing. It's, you know, it, it to me, it sucks that you had to hustle anymore because it just should have been waiting for you. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, months were going by cause I, you know, I, I had, I don't know, student loans to pay and, and you, you did some TV. Yeah. So, um, I think it was April. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So, you know, after you invited me for extra crispies, someone, a, a talent booker at the Hallmark channel saw that, and she said, hey, do you want to come out to L.A. and record a segment with us? I watch those segments and they're <laughs> wonderful. You Thank just you. you just pop on camera. Yeah. And it was uh, it was so much fun. And I realized, like, I actually really love, um, you know, I love doing this. And it is so different than a competition show where you are literally just there, like, completely raw with like everything you have trying to just give it your all like instead it it just kind of goes back a step and it's like I have this like wonderful thing I want to share with you and I get to share it opposed to like and I am also com- competing for my life right so, yeah. <laughs> so then that's got to be a different emotional oh process. it's yeah it's totally different but um I want to say it was April and I was sitting at work um and I was like you know what I'm not gonna get to where I want to go if I come to work and give them the first and best eight hours of my day and and they don't deserve anything less so the decision kind of made itself and I talked it over with family I talked over with my therapist and it's funny because everyone was like yeah it's time Mm -hmm. um And even the conservative people in my family were saying that. So I knew, like, yeah, it's time. I just didn't know how I was going to make it happen. Uh, And there's the saying, leap and the net will appear. So um, I love that. Yeah. So I made the decision. And then I was like, okay, so how are we going to make this work? (laughs) Right. And I think because in my head, I was I had I had already knew I was going to leave. Um. And I started reaching out to people and we we're just coming up with some ideas. And someone I reached out to was just like, yeah, I want to I want to make sure that like during this next six months or so, like you don't have to worry about things. So that was just like to me, it was like a shocking like blessing that was almost just waiting for me to make that decision mm-hmm. to like go and take it. And, uh, you know, sometimes I. I, and I, it's funny, I tell other people this sometimes. I'm like, accept the blessing. Like when good things are happening, like don't second guess it. When your gut is really telling you something, just go for it. Like accept the blessing. So that's what I did. And I was able to um, to transition to doing this full time. And undoubtedly, you know, that gave me time to work on my proposal and to do a few more television segments. Um, I did the Chew in June Yay. with uh, Carla Hall oh, and I love her. Michael Simon yeah. and Clinton Kelly. And they are like the most fun people. Uh, I never imagined I'd be on television, live television dancing. 
And I don't know how, but I ended up like we were making beignets. And how we, perfect. Yeah. And we went to commercial and everyone is dancing. So I'm dancing. And then we come back from commercial. And, still- and we're all still dancing. And they are just like, I don't, they, to me, I can't even imagine a more fun group of people like in an ensemble television thing and the thing is i didn't see that segment but i can imagine you absolutely being there and meeting that energy and, oh yeah and doing that and oh yeah it, it was one of those things where it's like they're giving me energy i'm giving them energy it was like um there's a word for this Sym- synergy, synergy. Or, <laughs> there's yes, something we were kinetic to- something we were totally know. synergizing um and then probably a few weeks after that i co-hosted a couple of um couple of segments on this show on fox called top 30 oh. yeah it was like a news show and i was talking baking news and we talked about stress baking oh, and procrastinating baking <laughs> all of um, the above <laughs> yeah so you know being able to 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 step away from my job and kind of just like walk into like the blessing of what was happening at the moment uh was something i don't take for granted and i know that it's enabled me to this point where um yeah, I get to make a cookbook with an amazing publisher. It's so well. You did another public thing mm-hmm. that a lot of people paid attention to. You gave, you introduced an award at the James Beard Awards uh, last year, and I just remember I was in the press room and everybody was riveted on what you had to say. And you were giving, a, you were uh, introducing the rising star baker. I believe yeah, it was um, outstanding pastry. Outs- outstanding chef. pastry. Yeah. Can you talk about the message that you delivered? It was, it was a perfect, beautiful thing that I think a lot of people shared afterward. Mm, thank you. Um, so the theme of last year's ceremony was um, I rise. And naturally, I, I thought about Maya Angelou, and I, I also thought about, like, yeasted breads. Right? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that's how your brain, you work on so many levels. Right. Uh, you know, I thought about Maya Angelou, and that poem of hers, it's mm-hmm. one that, like, whenever I hear, I will get goosebumps. And mm-hmm. there's one line, or, you know, there are a few lines in it, but um, I kind of wanted to make sure that, like, I had this, I actually, I had a platform where people would be listening and that I used it to pay homage to people who had come before me, um, whose shoulders that I stand on, who didn't get that recognition before. Um, People like, you know, both of my grandmothers, they both worked in in the homes of, of wealthy white people, you know, taking care of their kids and cooking, cooking them food before going home and doing the same for their own families. Um, And so, yeah, so I took that moment and I was like, you know, I rise for, I rise for the women who have done so much and who haven't been recognized. Um, Because, you know, so much that we have in this country was, was, it's based off of people whose work wasn't recognized and I want it to take a moment for them. So I, that's kind of what I said. I said, I rise for them. And also it's just so important that at this point, you know, it's like when you know better, you do better. Right. Mm -hmm. So we know better. And uh, I think that even me being invited to give that award shows like the great lengths that are being um, taken right now to to kind of have representation and to kind of celebrate and embrace um, not just diversity, but like all of the different things that like make us great and make American food what it is. So like not just African-American food ways, but yeah, we need to acknowledge that history and embrace that history and also embrace it currently. And in a way that's also not exploitative. Mm-hmm. Um so it was really it was so awesome to be there with people like Delester Miles, oh, who won, who won, um, people like Rodney Scott, who you know, won? who won, people <laughs> like Eduardo, Nina Compton, <laughs> Eduardo Jordan, I Eduardo Jordan, um, and over the past year, just seeing so many, you know, talented um, African American chefs, especially being given kind of that mainstream recognition. You know, this is this has been a long time coming and and I acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of so many people that have come before us. 
Well, the, the other thing that you did with that too, I believe you addressed the young girls. Oh yeah. And that, <laughs> that was the part I'm like, my, like I have goosebumps all over right now. Just remembering your, your talk, yeah. but you said specifically like for the girls with natural hair. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I think I said, you know, I, I want, I want the little girls with the curly hair and who are melanin rich to know that there's a place for them at the table too. And that was also just kind of drawing from my own experiences growing up also. Um, you know, you want to see people that look like you so that you can know like what's possible. Yeah. And tonight, I'm not sure when this is airing, but tonight you and I are going to be at the James Beard Journalism Awards. Yes. And I hope that we will be seeing some faces up there who really been doing the work all along and it's overdue. It's it's overdue. And there's so much more course correction to mm. be done to make sure that this is not just a, a lip service kind of thing and it doesn't just kind of revert to the old patterns, right. but that it this is properly recognizing not just recognizing but then making a system that supports people from all different kinds of backgrounds and stuff in the way that it should have should have should have all of this along and I really appreciate you using your your platform and your personhood and everything about you to to push that forward I, I think it's such a beautiful thing and I am too, is there a title for the book that is coming up um the title that was announced is Life is What You Bake It. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told in this book world, you know, things things change. They do. So. But that's, I mean, that's definitely, um, that's the working title. I love it. And I cannot wait to get my hands in there. And I hope you are going to be on the cover of this <laughs> as well. Because like, I, I just, you know, I, I just, I need the world to know you're, you're, your wonderfulness even more. <laughs> I have a few questions yeah. that I like to ask uh, of guests and you, you're one of the people who's, so now that we have some of the podcasts out, you may have heard uh, some of these, but because you know, you've, you've, I think you, you actually manifest this really well where you say into the universe, the thing mm -hmm. that you want, what is, what is the selfish thing that you want just for you? You're putting this energy into making a better place for other people and stuff. What is the thing you want for you? Yeah. At Kat, I wasn't ready for this question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I never know which questions are going to bust people open. Oh gosh. The, the, the selfish thing I want for me. Oh, um, You know, it's hard sometimes to, to like expose yourself and just be out there. That's what this question is kind of doing to me right now. Well, I'm, um, well the w way I can sort of phrase it too is I really believe that if you want something, yeah. you can say it out loud. So the universe then can yeah. help you do it. It's the, you know, yeah. I always joke about like the secret or whatever, <laughs> but at the same time, say like vocalizing these things yeah. because that puts it in somebody else's brain. Yeah. Like, oh, I can put that together for Valerie. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I definitely, I would love to have a television show. Yes. That's, that's definitely something that, um, that I am, that's on the radar. That's on my, it's on my radar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like, um, at the same time, I am so excited to like pour everything and to what I have going on currently. And I know that each thing I do is a step. Like that's what the past 12, 14 months have shown me. Like each thing is a step. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to a destination. Would you do something with me real quick? Yes. Lock pinkies. Okay. Invite me to the premiere of your show okay. because it's going to happen. No, absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. You're you're on like the the very short list. This, this show is going to happen. I just, dear casting directors, dear everybody, right here. This is this needs to happen. So, what is your comfort food? Ooh, I have so many. I have so many. I love pizza. Is it, you live in New York, so is it a New York thing? Is there or do you, is there a pizza a travel pizza that you like? 
No, but I'm, can I say a few more? Please. I love Krispy Kreme donuts. Ooh. Yes. It might be like a nostalgia thing because I grew up like, you know, on Saturday mornings, we'd go somewhere and they were nearby and you can see them on the conveyor belts. Oh, like, with the hot lights on? Yes. Oh, you just see the little donuts traveling down the conveyor belt to their fate, right? <laughs> of like, their fate is your mouth. being doused in icing and then like ushered into this box <laughs> and they just melt in your mouth and you know and I, it's funny I say I don't like sweet things and they couldn't be any more like pucker right. your lips sweet um, donuts macaroni and cheese oh tell me about your macaroni and cheese oh <sighs> um at home or out or where yeah honestly whoever's making it I'll eat it you know mm-hmm. I've, I've made it before but I I like when other people cook for me so um <laughs> well that actually goes into the next question what is the last meal that you had that somebody made for you in their home? Oh, that would be um, Easter. So a friend of mine, Angela Flournoy and her husband, they, so Angela grew up in LA. So she's very prone to making a lot of different, um, you know, Mexican food. So she made chilaquiles. Oh, I love chilaquiles. Yeah. Um, what else did they make? Chilaquiles with just like scrambled eggs and she made baked french toast two types of baked french toast one with brioche <laughs> one with french bread like in honor of what was happening um in france last week and at, she asked me to bring carrot cake so oh god i want to try your carrot cake I and i just i like man this girl can cook like and i love that like we're eating chilaquiles with scrambled eggs in new york you know, with my friends from college who most are from L.A. So Julie Kalis is such a perfect dish. Yeah, oh, I love it. What is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Oh, gosh. So I'm a very emotional person. It doesn't take much. <laughs> you know, I think like so I was at someone's house and they made me a latte mm. and they were kind of nervous because I guess they thought I'm like some harsh food critic. Um, but the latte was so good and it made me like just so grateful. Um, yeah, that's really sweet. I really yeah. love that. <laughs> Go latte person. <laughs> <laughs> what living musician would you want to cook for and what would you make them? Ooh. Um, and this is another say it out into the universe so it can help. And when, cause when they're a guest on your show, <laughs> Oh, gosh. Okay, so one of my favorite musicians is probably Darius Rucker. Oh, yeah. I think somebody else has said him. Really? I feel... Hootie from Hootie and the Blowfish, for those who are more familiar with that name. Uh, And he does country music. And it's funny because growing up, it was like, I don't like country music. Right. But then I realized I love this, like, folk folky type country like Tracy Chapman more like folk country um and I'm just such a fan of like of a lot of his songs they really resonate with me probably in a way that country songs do um where you know he's kind of like reflective about like you know things happen for a reason or you know it's fine I don't need much just like spaghetti and a bottle of wine and you with me by my side I'm like yes (laughs) That's what I want too. Like, <laughs> so is that what you would make for Darius Rucker? Like, or what would you? You would have to bake for Darius Rucker. Yeah, you know, I would make something real southern. Um, mm-hmm. but I would kind of like give it like a Valerie twist. Yeah. So it would it would it would be like something real southern, but kind of like Frenchified, you right. know? Um, so laminated pastry of some sort, or <laughs> exactly. But like, make it. I still want it to be like you know, food that feels good food that you think about the next day Mm. I don't want it to be so like dainty that it's like oh this is too this is too cute to eat or like I can't really just smash into this like so yeah something something southern but frenchified I love that and I feel like they're going back out on tour or something I wish they would come to New York they normally like I haven't seen I haven't seen Darius Rucker in New York. Or you mean Hootie and the Blowfish? Uh, ho- oh, Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh I yeah, I'll them. I'll see them too. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> they need to. Dear Darius Rucker, <laughs> there is somebody waiting to bake you a beautiful pastry. <laughs> Can I also just add Beyonce? <laughs> of course, she. Uh, Beyonce, Beyonce, you're not my second choice, but um, 
<laughs> and you know, so she's she's from Houston, so we have that like Southern connection. So I feel like she knows good she knows good food. Can I tell you, our mutual friend Kelly Fields has fed her. So she. I have heard this rumor. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Solange comes in to Willa Jean, which is Kelly Fields' restaurant, all the time, and. And basically, like Kelly built uh, Willa Jean as a Beyonce trap. Uh, so, like, someday we will catch her. Um, and her Solange comes in all, all the time. And finally, one day, she was like, okay, go time. And, <coughs> pardon me. Sorry. Okay, she was like, okay, it's go time. She's coming in here with Jay-Z. She was, it was not public at the time. I don't mm-hmm. think that she was pregnant. Mm. And Kelly just sent so much food out. And then she brought out the cornbread in the skillet. And um, she found herself, she she bowed. <laughs> to, or like genuflected or something, but kneeled to Beyonce with cornbread. And I think that's appropriate. I think, you know, Beyonce, like I would, I would bow to her. I think it should be legal. That yeah. Feel. Cause if, if there is American royalty and it's not Beyonce, then who the, who the heck is it? Like nope. it's, it's yeah. her. So we'll have to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take your, take your time. But um, I'm choking up Beyonce. <laughs> We'll have to catch Beyonce when she's not on like a vegan, sugar-free, right. carb-free, preparing for Coachella diet. Well, she said she's never doing that again, so, or right. at least, at least the preparing for. Her. Yeah, I don't. Like, some things you do once, right? Yeah, yeah, been yeah. there. I th- <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think Darius Rucker and Beyonce. I think that sounds like a lovely table. And let's say in this <clears throat> in this whirlwind of you know you. You have to hunker down and do a cookbook now, but you yeah. need to take some time for self-care. If you have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care, what do you do? So I actually, I have a coloring book. Oh. So uh, that is a way that I have been decompressing. So um, I try to go to the gym sometimes. I'm also reading Becoming by Michelle oh, Obama. yes. Which I'm, just makes me feel good inside. I just started it, yes. Yeah, and I feel like a kindred spirit with uh, Michelle. But um, You should bake for her, too. I would love to <laughs> uh, bake for you, Michelle. Uh, but yeah, so I also I have a coloring book. So when I have just a few minutes, I sit at my table, I pull out the coloring pencils, and as I'm coloring something in, because it's actually very, like the book is ridiculously intricate, but um, if I'm gripping the pencil too tightly... I know that I'm doing it and I loosen up my grip. Oh, I love it. What is the theme of this coloring book? It's got a lot of like butterflies and plants, nature, but like whimsical, whimsical nature. I wonder how many of those you will go through while you are writing your book. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I am, I I am just overwhelmed and excited for what it, what you have accomplished and what is coming next. And I am so thrilled that you're writing this cookbook. I can't wait for the world to to see it. And I imagine that people will be able to follow you on social as it is coming together. So Yeah. Yeah. So you are so people will be able to follow you at uh, at Foodie in New York on all the different platforms. Mm-hmm. All the different platforms. And also um, if you subscribe to email updates on my blog, you will definitely not miss any of the big announcements. Okay. How do they get to your blog? We'll That's have a just, link here, yeah. but foodieinnewyork.com. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much to our guest today, Valerie Lomas. Uh, it's, I, again, I, this, this book, I can't wait to hold it in my hands. You've earned every bit of this. Thank you so much for having me, Kat. Oh, such a joy. And thank you to our producers, Jennifer Martinick, Alicia Gabral, and Amy Frank. Thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us, because those help with the algorithms and all that and help more people hear us. If there is something you would like for us to talk about or a guest you would like to hear from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter. Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and at Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thanks for listening and take good care of yourself until the next time. <laughs>